Today we want to transition into the thought when we are inevitably afraid. And we entitled our message, When I'm Afraid. I want to begin by reading Psalm 56, and then we'll make some comments on that before going into three examples in Scripture of men who were brave, and then lastly, what to do when you face moments in your life that causes you to fear. Psalm 56, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Now, reading that first verse of that psalm, if you notice the subheading, this is a psalm of David when the Philistines took him in Gath. And so this is a psalm that David writes in affliction. What type of affliction? Well, an enemy military taking him in. You know, there was a time that David went among them and he actually pretended to be an absolutely insane person so that he could escape. David was a man of great strategery. He was a brilliant man. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. Now listen to verse 3, and we're going to come back to it in a moment. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. From Hebrews chapter 13 last week, we concluded with the quotation of this particular verse. If I believe in God, if I trust in God, I will not fear what man can do unto me, as Hebrews 13 says. Every day they rest my words, they twist what he says. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together, they hide themselves, they mark my steps, they take note of his path, and they conspire against him, as it were. When they wait for my soul, they're looking out for him to kill him. This is a pretty desperate time in his life. Shall they escape by iniquity? And thine anger cast down the people, O God. And that's an example of what you might call an imprecatory prayer. I often have to laugh a little bit within myself when we're reminded in Paul's writings to pray for our leaders. There might even be times in our lives to pray the imprecatory prayers of the Psalms. There were times that the psalmist would pray, Lord, break their teeth which despise you. I don't know if we've prayed that prayer about our leaders lately, break their teeth. But there are certainly times when through divine inspiration, men and women of God prayed even for the destruction of those who hated God and who did cruelly to God's people. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into a bottle, are they not in a book? I love the poetic nature of that statement. Put thou my tears in the bottle, in thy bottle. Take notice, in other words, of the times that I cry unto thee. Are they not in thy book? Do you not have knowledge of the times that I suffer in this world? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is with me. Now, the last point that we're going to consider today is going to have to do with the statement that David just made there in verse 9. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is with me. In God will I praise His word, in the Lord will I praise His word. In God have I put my trust, I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. Do you notice he's repeating statements he made earlier in this psalm? Thy vows are upon me, O God, I will render praises unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Now let's back up to verse 3, and I want to notice a phrase that we observed as we read this passage together. Psalm 56 and verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. As men, we do not want to admit that we are afraid. Oh, we want to be brave. We want to be bold. As little kids running around the neighborhood that... I'll get bored and get into fist fights or throw rocks at cars or do whatever it is that young kids do. We did all kinds of things when I was a kid because they hadn't invented the internet yet. I am that old. There was no internet. We ran around and we got into trouble. 
And there were times that we were afraid, but you would not hear a little boy admit to another little boy that he was afraid. And we grow up that way. We're trained that way. We don't want to admit fear. We want to be macho. We want to be tough. We want to put our chests in the air and walk around as if we're the biggest, baddest, toughest dude that has ever walked the shores of this world. If not, even pretending that we are outright invincible. I'm not afraid of anything. Now, truth be told, it doesn't matter who you are. There are things in this world that can make you afraid. If you don't believe me, go out in your front yard. Maybe you have a toddler, maybe you have grandchildren, and one of them is a toddler, and let that child begin to run into a busy road. Suddenly you're afraid, and you do whatever you can, whatever you can to run and grab them and take them back into safety. Oh, you don't believe that you're ever afraid? Let your child wander off into the ocean and let the currents begin knocking them over and pulling them away. You'll see very quickly that all of that rhetoric in your mind and perhaps from your mouth about never being afraid might have been an, might have been an episode of you attempting to convince yourself, if not others, that fear was something that didn't apply to you. No, we can all be afraid. Several of us over the past year was given a diagnosis that we had a virus that's going around the world, and we know many people died from it. And while I wasn't worried about myself, when that diagnosis came to my front porch and to my house, you better believe I was worried about what was going to happen in my wife's life because of her health problems. You better believe that I worried about those of you here who were over the age of 60 and even 70, and some of you the age of 80, who were diagnosed with that virus, yeah, I was concerned. I was worried. And it wasn't without warrant. But what about some of the terrible things like strokes or heart attacks or cancers? I've said it many times. It doesn't matter who you are. Those terms are going to become less hypothetical or theoretical and more experiential as you age. Whether yourself or your spouse or your parents or your grandparents, you will know people who get cancer. You will know people who have heart attacks. You will know people who have strokes. In fact, in this room today, there are people that have had most of those, if not all of those things. And praise God, God bless you to heal from that and to recover from that. When you're in a doctor's office, a cold, sterile doctor's office, and the word cancer rolls off his tongue, Nothing causes your heart to sink in your chest more than hearing those words. If you've ever heard those words, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. I've had two family members die from lung cancer, but probably the most scary, one of the most scary times for us was back in 2016 when my mother had an undiagnosed mass in her brain or yet to be identified mass in her brain that was Identified on a CT scan, she'd been having symptoms, her right eye and her ear would just stop working, and the right side of her tongue was numb. She fainted driving down I-459 one day. Talk about terrifying when your mom faints while driving down the interstate. My father was in the car and took the wheel and pulled over for her. When she goes and gets the scan and there's a mass in her brain, later identified as an aneurysm, as a little boy... I don't care if you're 40 years old, when your mom has a mass in her brain, you suddenly become that little boy again who's afraid. And all you can do in those moments is to cry out to God. Listen, I could go on and on about my experiences, my wife's experiences, your experiences. We all know we've been there. If you're not there right now, there are things in the world that cause you to be afraid. Despite the fact that we try to convince ourselves that nothing ever makes us afraid, no, there are things in the world that absolutely terrify us. Be of good cheer. What does David say in verse 3? I'm never afraid. Here I am surrounded by Philistines. The man that slew the giant of Gath. And I'm not afraid. Is that what David said? No. David, being surrounded by his enemies that would swallow him up, 
that fight against him says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I begin at this text this morning to say that even David was at times afraid. A man who says he's afraid of nothing is more akin biblically to a fool than anything else. If you read the Proverbs, there's one individual that doesn't seem to be afraid of anything, and that's the fool. And because of that, his life is one of often suffering. Fear, being afraid, is a natural human response to the threat of something that is destructive. When I was 14, you know the story about me driving a car too fast on a road with my parents' permission and skidding sideways and flipping it and ended up in a ditch with the roof of it flattened. But that moment when the vehicle begins to slide sideways and you're skidding and you're totally out of control right before you hit the ditch, literally the words that came out of my mouth were, I'm going to die as it slides sideways at an undisclosed mile an hour. You know, sometimes my parents listen to these. The, the lingering question is, what were you doing driving without your parents at 14? That's the real question here. Anyway, shift the blame. You know the heart-sinking feeling when something terrible is about to happen and there doesn't seem to be any way to prevent it. That's what we want to speak to this morning. What time I am afraid. We all will be afraid. If we have any sense, there are things that will scare us. The psalmist here gives us our retreat from fear. In Psalm 56 and verse 3, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. David takes the fear, the emotion, the energy, if you will, and he redirects that emotion into trust. Now this is something that I... To give you another secular example, another non-spiritual example, I should say, as a performing musician, before you go on to stage, you are nervous. Now, some of us are so egotistical that we really look forward to getting on stage, but most people, before they get on stage, are nervous. And professional musicians will often talk about how you take those butterflies and that energy and you repurpose it as performance energy. In other words, if you're nervous about it, you begin to hype yourself up and excite yourself about it, and you begin to try to channel that emotion through your voice or the bell of your horn or your drums or your guitar, whatever it is that you're, that you're doing to perform. You redirect the energy into something else. David says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee when I am terrified Take that emotion and refocus it towards trust in God. And you notice throughout this psalm, David talks about how he will call upon God, how he will put his trust in God. He has put his trust in God. He will praise him. He will praise God's word over and over. He's re focusing himself from the affliction by calling upon God, trusting in God, and praising God. You see, he's not doing one thing that he would want to do, and rather he's using that energy, that emotion, that time, and that energy. He is repurposing that towards praise and trust and prayer. Now, there's a secret right there. David says, I'm not going to tarry in this fear I'm not going to let it consume me. I'm not going to wallow around in it. I'm not going to dwell there. I'm going to repurpose this emotion, as it were. I'm going to refocus it in a better area. I want to give you a few thoughts on fear up front, and this is all laying some groundwork about some of the examples that we want to give you and ultimately what Scripture would have us to do in times that we would be afraid. Up front, not all fear <clears throat> is bad. What's one case in which fear is a good thing? The Bible commends as healthy and even spiritual a reverential fear of God. Now, the book of Romans chapter 3 says concerning the unregenerate, there is no fear of God before their eyes. 
That tells me that prior to the new birth, a man has absolutely no fear of God in his heart. The natural man does not fear God. He does not respect God. He does not honor God. He does not worship God. He does not know God. He does not call upon God. He doesn't believe in God. But after the new birth occurs in a man's life as a byproduct of a spiritually living soul, that man or that woman has a fear of God in their heart. If you read through the book of Acts, you find one example after another of a God-fearer that the Lord sends his gospel to. You've got a man such as Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 who feared God with all his house. He prays to God. And God sends an angel to him to tell him that his prayers have been heard in heaven. God sends the apostle Peter to this man Cornelius to preach to him and to baptize him. And this is the beginning of the Gentile church. What was that man? Well, he was a God-fearer. In fact, if you read through the book of Acts, you notice this. Every time the word of God is received by somebody, this is a person that fears God. And so that tells us that some forms of fear, in a sense, are good. Our God is a consuming fire. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is so holy, so righteous, that no man can see Him in their present form and live. Were we to be in front of God in all His glory and our present wretched sinfulness, we would be obliterated. Men who saw Him in vision in the form of Christ in His glory in Scripture fall on their face as dead men. That tells you something. Some of the greatest men in Scripture fall on their face. Their comeliness is turned to corruption as Daniel experienced in the book of Daniel or John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 1, when he sees Christ in his glory, falls on his face as a dead man. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So we ought to fear God. Now, when we talk about having fear of God, we're not talking about walking around every day as if a lightning bolt is about to strike us right in the face. Immediate doom is pending. That isn't how God wants us to live our lives. We're to live our lives in assurance and love and peace and fellowship with Him. But at the same time as a sinner, I am to understand that God is holy and I am not. And any holiness I have, He gives me. And were it not for His grace, I would be separated from Him for eternity in the lake of fire. And that changes the way we think about life. We walk in a reverential fear of God. Number two up front, the type of fear that we're discussing today is unhealthy. Now, if you're a person that revels in being afraid of things, might I just interject the thought today that that is not healthy? I think we've seen on display this year about as many unhealthy attributes and characteristics and behaviors that we could see in such a short period of time. We had fear, we had anger, we had outrage, we had hysteria and paranoia, and we had great division in our country between people. It was a time of anxiety and animosity, and I, for one, am very thankful that that season is more and more behind us as a culture. But living in constant fear, reveling in it as it were, is unhealthy. In fact, according to 1 John chapter 4, we'll look at verse 18, fear is actually torture. Fear torments us as a form of torture. John writes in 1 John chapter 4, Herein, in verse 17, is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, when John says we have boldness in the day of judgment, he contrasts this with being ashamed at the coming of Christ. And John writes about both things in this first epistle of 
1 John, this epistle of 1 John. If I live in such a way that I am sinful and indulging in the flesh in the moment when Christ comes back or even at the thought of Christ coming back, there will be shame in my emotional state because of my behavior. So if I think about the second coming and I'm living a very sinful life, I think, Lord, don't come back today because I'm ashamed of the way I'm living. However, if I'm living for Christ and I'm praying to him and I'm reading and I'm mortifying the flesh and I'm anticipating his second coming, when I think about his second coming, rather than, no, Lord, not today, my mindset is going to be, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And rather than having shame at the notion of his coming, I have what? I have boldness. Fear causes us not to have boldness at the thought of the coming of the Lord, but shame. Now, again, in the moment that Jesus comes back, whatever period of time that is between when he returns and when we are glorified, when that trump sounds, if he comes back at 3 a.m. and you're in the middle of a bar trying to take home some woman drunk out of your mind, when that trump sounds, buddy, you're going to be ashamed. And you're going to think, oh, Lord, of all the places for you to come back and catch me. But if you're sitting at home with your wife or children, or like you ought to be doing at 3 a.m., either praying or sleep, not a whole lot of good that's going on at 3 in the morning. And when that trumpet sounds and you hear it and you see Christ descending and bodies start to rise from the ground before you're glorified, whatever period of time that is, however that happens, you're not going to be ashamed. You're going to be confident. We want to live in such a way to be confident at his coming. Now, We understand the truth as it is in grace. If you're a disobedient child of God, you're still a child of God. And once you're glorified, you're carried to be with Him in glory, you will not be there because of what you do. But the way you live does impact how you perceive the second coming of Christ. Either something you are ashamed of yourself in or something that you have great confidence and boldness in. Now that's what he's talking about in verse 17. But I want to apply this in a little more broad way of a scope as we look at verse 18. Herein is our love made perfect that is fulfilled that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. I'm living like Christ in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear, listen to me, fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. If I am fearing the second coming of Christ, there's more maturity I stand in need of as a disciple. And I'm being tormented by that fear. Fear torments you. Now, we all knew that, even if we didn't know that. When you're lying awake at night worrying about something, that's an outworking of fear in your heart. Does that not torment you? Does it not afflict you? Does it not plague you? Fear torments us. It's a cruel taskmaster. It harms you physically, not to mention emotionally and relationally. You look at a person who's been dealing with chronic fear and worry and anxiety in their life, and you look at them before and after, you can see the way that their health has even been impacted by the things that they're going through. If you deal with fear or worry and you struggle with that, then today's message is certainly one that I hope is a blessing to you. Fear torments us. Fear torments us. It tortures us. Third, again laying some thoughts up front, what would my sermon be without a 40-minute preface? This doesn't encourage reckless living. Caution is wise. When you got in the car today, I trust that the first thing that you did was put on your seatbelt. Did you do that because you were afraid? No. Rather, you did that because it's simply a matter of caution. If some person runs into you and they hit you on the way or you run off the road because you put on the seat belt you'll be in a better position to survive the accident than if you didn't my children love to ride bicycles and skateboards and scooters and they despise wearing helmets i grew up in the 80s before there were such things as head injuries because we didn't have to wear helmets we didn't wear seat belts either 
You just put the little kid in the back seat and let him play in the floorboard and, I don't know, the strongest survive. Battle of the fittest, you know. If you made it past life in the 70s or 80s or 30s, 40s, and 50s, for that matter, you know that you had genes that blessed you to survive. Joking aside, it was just as dangerous then, and because of that, we have things such as bicycle helmets. I make the kids wear helmets, and they despise it, but I tell them, God gave you one brain. You got two eyes. You don't want to live without both of them, but if one of them gets put out, you can still see. You got two ears. If you go deaf in one of them, you can still hear something. You've got two lungs, two kidneys, two hands, two feet. You got one brain. So guess what I make them do, at least until they're out of my sight? I make them put on a helmet, and they don't like it. But they have one brain, and I don't want their brain. I, t I tell them, I changed your diaper for two years. I don't want to change your diaper for the next four decades. I don't want you to get a head injury and then me have to take care of you for the next four decades. It's not that I'm scared. It's just simply caution. Caution is not the same as fear. How do you know that? Proverbs 22, 3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. The prudent man foresees the evil. This proverb occurs twice in Proverbs. This statement. Prudent man foreseeth the evil and hides himself. The simple pass on and are punished. If the tornado siren down by Mount Carmel Elementary School sounds, the tornado siren sounds, and I turn on my weather app, and I'm in the polygon, you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to sit there in my recliner playing video games like nothing's happening. I'm going to get all my kids, they're going to put on helmets, again with the helmets, they're going to go into the closet, they're going to put pillows over their heads, and we're going to wait until the polygon or the tornado is gone and the polygon moves on to somebody else's neighborhood. Am I afraid of tornadoes? No. But you know what? I've done enough disaster relief to know what they do to a home. And after April 2011, we all know what tornadoes can do to a community. And so... Being prudent and wise, I hide myself from the evil. Who passes on and gets punished? The simple. Do you want to be simple-minded or do you want to be prudent? Do you want to be foolish or do you want to be wise? So caution is not fear. Lastly, along these lines, we all have to act in bravery or boldness from time to time. Even if you're a hermit who lives in the woods, eventually a pack of coyotes is going to come to the door of your cave. It doesn't matter how you hide yourself or how you exclude yourself from society. There are going to be things in your life that you have to face. And when you're called upon to face those things, whether it's a matter of Christian persecution, which is what we're going to look at here in a moment, or simply the afflictions of this life, to face them with bravery is what we're called on to do. And we're to act in bravery and boldness. From time to time, we will all have to act in bravery and in boldness. Now, let's turn to a few examples of this. We want to go to the book of 1 Samuel. We'll begin in chapter 16, just hit a few high points, and look at the story, a very common story. You children will know it, the story of David and Goliath. This past Wednesday night, we gave a message from the book of Obadiah here at our Wednesday night study. And we made the point that, you know, Obadiah is about the nation of Edom and how God is going to judge them, how Edom was never a threat to Israel. They were never a military threat. Many of the countries that Israel defeated were serious military threats. In fact, there was no reason in the world that Israel should have been able to defeat them. That's exactly the story of faith from the Old Testament. Because when you look back at everything, there's no reason that Israel should have been able to go out of Egypt with such miracles and plagues and wealth. There's no way that Israel should have gone into Canaan's land and overthrown that land full of giants and walled cities and militaries and men of valor. There's no way that should have happened, but it happened because God was with them. As we think about the story of David and Goliath, this is one of those stories 
one of those accounts, there's no way that what happened should have happened in the life of David versus Goliath. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel, the prophet, goes and anoints David as king of Israel. David was not the first king. Saul, King Saul, was the first king of Israel, but Saul was a man who had disobeyed God, and because of that, he is rejected as king. God sends Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel, and this is interesting because David is anointed king before he goes to present himself to the battle that would solidify his position and his reputation, building upon that, eventually being received as the king. Now, how does that sound like another individual that we read of in Scripture? Well, see, Jesus was anointed before he ever makes his debut on the scene. He goes and he fights a colossal battle against a Goliath that none of us could stand before sin. And being the victor of that, we worship him and understand today that he is the true king who even sits upon the throne of David. So much of David's life pictured Christ before Christ came. In 1 Samuel 16, Samuel anoints David as king of Israel. Now Saul's still on the throne. David was as good as king. He was anointed king. He would be king, but Saul would have to eventually meet his end. Chapter 17, verse 1, the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. Verse 2, Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. The Philistines were on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. You've got two mountains. You've got an army on each mountain. You've got a valley in between them and it's a standoff. They're set at array against each other. Verse 4, there came out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. This man was, if a cubit is 18 inches, and that's debated, are we dealing with a Babylonian cubit, an Egyptian cubit, is it a different type of cubit? We really don't know, but the man was at least nine feet tall. And when you think about Goliath, please understand, this is not like the jolly green giant that stands... 50 feet, but this is a man that's more of like 9 to 10 feet. Do we ever see men 8, 9 feet tall? Very rarely, but yes, we do. If you uh, turn on professional basketball, which I never do, the last time I watched professional basketball was when the Bulls played the Lakers. Michael Jordan was still playing for the Bulls. How long ago was that? 25, 30 years? 30 years probably. That's the last time I watched basketball. But these men tower over other men. I mean, they're seven and a half feet tall. This man, Goliath, was likely about nine, nine and a half feet tall. He was that tall, but he wasn't as a lot of the men that we've seen in movies and such that are tall because of some sort of a problem. But their muscular, or their skeletal system rather, is not formed correctly. This man is strong. I mean, he looks like a professional wrestler. I mean, this guy is extraordinarily strong. He's tall, and he could just absolutely obliterate any individual man who came against him. By the way, this is why we invented firearms. (laughs) Goliath comes out and he says, Let's fight. Me against any one of you. If I win, you're our servants. If you win, we're your servants. We'll make an arrangement. We'll fight this war by proxy. One of us versus one of you, and the battle will be decided. The men of Israel sat there quaking in their shoes. Not a one of them was bold enough to go down there and fight this man. It talks about his size and his strength. And if you just read verses... 
5 through 7, you get the weight and the size of his armors. His spear was like a weaver's beam. The head of his spear weighted 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. He's got somebody before him bearing a shield. And he just cries out to them. He mocks them. He scoffs at their God. Now, David is a little shepherd boy. He's not yet fully a man, really. He's a keeper of his father's sheep. In his life until this point, he's had to defend the sheep of his father. Still, does that sound like Christ? He slew a bear at one point to rescue his father's sheep, and he slew a lion. He's got a weapon of choice, a sling. Not a slingshot, but a sling. It's a couple of ropes or straps with a pouch, and you would put a stone in it and sling it and release one side of it, and it would propel that rock, that stone, through the air at a high rate of speed, and you could hunt with it. You could kill something with it if you were good at using it. David comes down and he hears this matter and he asks the question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the army of the living God? Verse 26. David is livid at the scoffings and mockings of this giant. By the way, David in his life was a man of war. David was not a pacifist. He was not a weak man. He was meek, he fought for the Lord, he was not self-willed, but this man was a brilliant strategist, he was a a strategist, he was a man that had great military brilliance and might. He goes out against this giant, he stands before him and the giant laughs at him. Saul tries to put his armor on David, he puts it on, it's too big, it doesn't fit, and David's like, I can't wear this. This hasn't been proved. David goes down and he gets five smooth stones. People have argued the significance of that for hundreds of years. I do think it ironic that there were five giants, the sons of Gath. Why did he get five smooth stones? Did he think he needed to sling five times? Or maybe he had one for each giant. You know, I got a bullet with your name on it, buddy. Well, he goes out against that giant, that giant mocks, that giant scoffs. Am I a dog that you send this boy out to fight me? David winds that sling up, takes that stone, and he buries it in the head of Goliath. Verse 49, he hasted, he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He put his hand in his bag. He took thence a stone. He slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. That's not the end of the matter. David takes the man's own sword and takes his head from him and takes it and presents it to King Saul. Sometimes people are like, why do you let your children watch things like Lord of the Rings? And I'm like, hey, have you read the Old Testament? I mean, that's, that's violent. It's a very bloody book. David acts in bravery. David is bold. He had every reason in the world to be afraid, but by faith, David slew the giant. Faith strengthened him, according to Hebrews 11. Another one in the book of Acts chapter 19 People who acted in boldness and bravery. Acts 19, verse 23. That last example is from the Old Testament. This one's from the New Testament. You've got countless examples of men and women who acted in boldness and bravery, who had reason to be afraid but put their trust in God, praised God, prayed to God, and went out and did things by faith. At the same time, Paul is out preaching in, as it says here in verse 22, Asia. He would be in Asia Minor. He was in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. Acts 19, verse 23. At the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. He's making money. When Paul goes into a city, people are converted... When people are converted, the idol makers are out of a living. He puts the idol makers out of a living. What do the idol makers do? 
well, they become livid that their income has been diminished. He called together the workmen of like occupation. They're going to unionize. <laughs> Sirs, you know that by this craft we have had our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying, They be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the, that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. Well, he's going to convert everybody in this town so that nobody worships Diana anymore. Her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. You have a mob scene. You have a riot. Having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions, and traveled, they rushed with one accord into the theater. Now you say, theaters, I haven't been to one of those in a year. I love going to the theater. We go to watch a movie. You know what they did in theaters there? People debated. People presented orations. But another thing that they did in the theaters in Ephesus is they would drag men and women in there and execute, uh, execute them by feeding them to wild animals that would tear them to shreds. They dragged them into the theater. This isn't going to see the latest Marvel movie or the latest Star Wars it's kind of amazing the things that we do today that came from some terrible thing 2,000 years ago, such as going to the theater. The circus is likewise. We've got all these lions in a, in a room and elephants, and we're like, oh, look, the lions, isn't that nice? Rewind history 2,000 years, and it wasn't such a pleasant thing to be in the circus with the lions. What does Paul do? They drag Paul's companions into the theater. This is a riot scene. The whole town is livid. The whole town is screaming. What are they screaming? Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Yesterday I was driving to a rehearsal and there was a group of about 100 people protesting something that's happening in the Middle East. And I thought, what's that going to do? You're in Huntsville. Nobody here goes over there. Nobody over there is going to come over here. What in the world are you doing? But they were out there. They were screaming signs and screaming and pumping their fists. And I'm like, oh, that wasted energy. You could be doing something productive on your Saturday afternoon. These people are out screaming and yelling. They drag these men into the theater. Look at what Paul does in verse 30. I thought about this, print, this uh, verse all week, this example all week. When Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples suffered him not. They're throwing Christians to wild animals. And Paul says, oh, there's a lot of them in there. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to preach to them. And the disciples are holding them back. You ever seen somebody hold somebody else back? Maybe your friend wants to get into a fist fight in high school and everybody's holding them back. A lot of times people would let other people hold them back because they really didn't want to fight. They just want to pound their chest and look cool and tough and bad. Paul is being held back by his friends because he was going to go in there and preach. And they're holding him back. They're like, no, Paul, you can't do that because you're going to die. And he's like, let me at him. I'll go preach to him. I don't care if I die. Is he insane? No, he's bold in Christ. He understands that all they can do is take his life, and at the moment his physical life ends, he's with Christ in glory, which is far better. And all of the sufferings this man wrote of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us in that day. And so he looks at his death and he says, what is that to me? I know that Christ is coming back. I know that I'll be with him in glory and soul and spirit. And even this body, if it be torn to shreds by lions, will be raised again incorruptible, conformed to the image of Christ. And it all the pain, the teeth, the claws, the trampling, that doesn't even bear any worthiness to be compared to the glory that I'll experience in that day. I'm not afraid of that. Therefore, some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. That's another thing about mobs. They're often confused. The more part knew not whether they were to come together they draw Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. He beckons with the hands, would have made his defense. Eventually, 
This crowd is appeased by threat of, hey, you're going to get us in trouble with Rome, and it is dispersed. But the example I wanted to give you out of that was Paul's boldness. Now, there's a lot of us who, when confronted with an angry mob wanting to kill us because we're preaching Christ, we want to run and hide. Paul says, oh, they're in the theater? Let me go in there and preach the word of God to them. By the way, this comes into Paul's rhetoric in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Talking about the resurrection, he says, what does it profit me if I fought, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Why does Paul say he's willing to go and even be mauled to death preaching the gospel to a coliseum of people because he knows that he will rise again. Lastly, you will not find a greater example of bravery in the face of destruction than our Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus at the day of the triumphal entry knows everything that's going to befall him when he goes into Jerusalem. He knows he's going to be betrayed. He knows he's going to be forsaken by his friends. He knows he's going to be put on three mock trials before Pilate, Herod, and Caiaphas, the high priest. He knows that they will scourge him, that they will beat him, that they will dig a crown of thorns into his brow. He knows that they will make him carry his cross through public scorn and shame and ridicule. He knows that they will nail him to the tree. He knows that he will be made the sin bearer for God's people and judged as if he lived their life and that he will die. And yet he set his face as a flint, knowing all the things that would befall him. He went and he suffered. You know the first thing that he does when he goes in? He goes into the temple, he flips over the tables of the money changers and he runs everyone out that bought and sold in the temple. And then he goes on to preach a sermon against the powers that be in Jerusalem for their hypocritical, pharisaical treatment of God's people. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. He spends the entirety of Matthew 23 talking about that. In chapters 24 and 25, he teaches about the destruction of Jerusalem for their rejection of him, his second coming, and the destruction of the world. It doesn't shy him away from any of that. All right, in closing... What do we do when we're afraid? Well, the first thing that you need to do, again, from the psalm we read, you need to call on God. Rather than worrying, refocus your energy, your emotion, your mind on God by calling on Him, first and foremost. I've given a few different references of that we won't give you, but in Genesis 4, men began to call upon the name of the Lord, and you have men and women over and over in this book for the last thousands of years who called upon the name of the Lord in their moments of affliction. When you are afraid, call on Him. So many times we have the thought that, well, I might as well pray because it can't hurt, and that is the opposite of the mentality that we ought to have in our moments of fear. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and in safe. How do we run into the name of the Lord? Well, that's a metaphorical statement. We do so by calling upon the name of the Lord. We call upon Him. And secondly, we'll close with the exhortation that we find in 1 Corinthians 16.13, to quit you like men. Quit ye like men. What does it mean to quit ye like men? To be a man, to be brave, to be strong. It's a term that we read in Samuel's writings to be a man. I'm going to give you the dying quote of one of the early English reformers. Shortly before being burned at the stake with another man, this man's name is Hugh Latimer, and he was burned at the stake with a man named Nicholas Ridley. He was burned at the stake for denying the heresies of papacy. 
As he looks at Nicholas, Nicholas is afraid. And Hugh Latimer looks at him and he says, Play the man, Mr. Ridley. Play the man. What's he telling him? Quit you like men. Be a man. Be brave. Be bold. If you can't be the man, play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. You know, one of his controversial viewpoints, Hugh Latimer wanted the Word of God translated in the English language. People had been begging God for an English translation of the Bible that they could freely use for many years. Quit you like men. In moments of fear, play the man. Be brave. Stand in God's strength. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the strength that we have in you, Lord. We confess that there are times that we are all afraid. There are always bigger adversaries. There's always a bigger fish. There's always a tougher man. There's always someone in the world that wants to hurt, to steal, and to kill, and destroy. We know that's why the enemy comes into this world into these various situations to kill and to steal and destroy. But Father, in those moments when we are afraid, Lord, let us put our trust in you. Let us call upon your name. Let us run into your name as a strong tower. Let us be brave like David, offended that the giant would speak against you. Let us be brave like Paul, bold enough to go into a theater full of evil beasts that would devour him, simply willing to preach the word of God, not even to do battle but simply to share the message. Lord, let us be as brave as Christ who set his face as a flint and went into that holy city knowing everything that would befall him in accord with your will to die for our sins. Help us, Father, to quit like men. Help us to call upon your name, to praise you, to praise your word, to be strong, to play the man. We ask this in Jesus' name and we say amen. Praise God from whom all blessings